Um, you press your button? You I, no, 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 not press our buttons. When I to... said the lovely chap in the corner knows what he is doing, telepathy is close to one of his talents. Uh, yes, he, we, we will not press our buttons. When it is our turn to speak, come to that in a minute, he will do it for us. He'll just sense. That he will sense it. that the moment has come. Um, yeah, clever. Uh, so there's that. There. Yeah, and it tells you when you have to speak. And if you don't have a red light, you're not it. So uh, if you if you want to speak and you don't have a red light in front of you, you have to attract my attention, and I will do my best to watch. But if you think I'm inadvertently missing you, wave or scream. Yes. See, resourceful woman. Um, so that's the first part of the instructions. Um, let me talk through quickly what it is we're going to do. Um, Can you say who you are? Yes, no, I, my, yeah, uh, my name's Anne, Anne Connor, and I'm from outside the box. Um, and I, I was asked by Glenda to be one of the um, facilitators for this. And I've got my instructions on what we've to do. Um, and if it doesn't quite work out that way, that's fine because we'll all be creative. Um, <laughs> We're going to, I'm going to start actually by doing something I'm not supposed to do, which is get everybody quickly to introduce themselves, because I think it's easier to know who's all in the room. Um, but when you speak at something, um, you might want to just the first couple of times say, I'm and from wherever, just to remind us where you're from. Um, we'll go over what we're doing. Then the lovely Diana here is going to say something just to kind of remind folk what the kind of the topics are and, and how we're doing this. Brevity will be my key. Yeah. The lovely person there, Sarah, is doing the f scribing. So if at any point we've forgotten what we've said, we can helpfully say to her and she will remind us, which is always a good wheeze. So um, we'll introduce ourselves. Um, Diana's going to say, just remind us what the kind of topics are. What we're then going to do is just have maybe a kind of very brief discussion, but we've been asked to then choose two topics that we feel quite strongly about. In a sense, everything we talk about comes within the point that Tom said in his um, piece this morning, which is it's thinking about what will help social justice, what will help equality in our society in Scotland for older people. So that's kind of running through everything. And even if we kind of wander off to another topic, we're, I think we're still within that very broad thing about equality and, and, and social justice for older people. Um, we've been asked to decide on two of the kind of main topics that we want to talk about, and we can then get into those in a bit more depth. But at some point, and about quarter past, um, to, if we've not got to it by then, I'll start to pull us into saying we need to decide what action points we want to be taking from this. And we've then to agree, I think they said one, but let's be ambitious and go for two or three um, action points. And again, Diana will, on our behalf, report these with strength and conviction oh, and vigour and everything else we've got. Um, so can we start by just quickly going round, and I think it's kind of your name and who and where you're from. I know that many people are wearing about four hats, um, so you can either quickly tell us all of your four hats or the main one that you happen to be today. And the first challenge for that is Diana. Oh, am I coming this way? Yes. Right. My name's Diana Findlay. Um, I represent Age Scotland. I'm a regional ambassador for Age Scotland for the Borders and also chair a Borders Older People Services Forum. Sarah Bryson and I work with the City of Edinburgh Council and I'll take some notes today. Okay. Hi, I'm Eric Samuel from the Big Lottery Fund. Hello, my name's Tom Galbraith. I'm from Police Scotland. I work locally here in Edinburgh. My name is Margaret Cameron. I'm from the Centre for Lifelong Learning. My name's Mary Benson and I'm here representing West Lothian Senior Forum. Anne Burney for South Lanarkshire Seniors Together. Hi, I'm Helen Ford. I represent Leith. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm James Orr, and I'm representing Grey Matters, Helensburgh. I'm Dave Roper, and I'm also representing Grey Matters, Helensburgh. 
I'm John Parkhill, and I'm re representing Strathclyde University's Senior Students Association. My name is Dave Reid for Fife, and I'm representing the Workers' Educational Association, uh, Adult Learning, and also the Scottish Learning Partnership Forum, Adult Learning as well. Uh, I'm Joyce Armstrong, um, only one of several people from A City for All Ages in Edinburgh. My name is Betty Wilson, Phyllis of Gatecrashed. I'm not really representing any, although I am in the U3A locally in Bearsden, which has not hosted one of these. Um, and I'm also a carer for two very elderly people. I'm Harriet Campbell. I'm uh, re representing, well, African Caribbean women, but not the older. Well, mixture. <laughs> I'm Joan Turner from Edinburgh. I've been involved with SOPA since the beginning, and I'm interested in transport and housing and involved in various committees to do with that. I'm Michael Granger. I'm here uh, as a member of LGBT Health here in Edinburgh. I'm Bill McKee. I'm representing LGBT Health and Wellbeing uh, the Age Forum. Brilliant. So... Big range of people across the country, huge range of wealth, of wisdom and experience and all sorts of things. Diana, do you want to remind us right. topics? So, just as in your programme, you'll see the first, quickly, housing and community safety. And housing seems to be coming up as a topic um, of more and more importance, How, house for life and all those sort of things. So that might be what you're particularly interested in. And you'll see there that these topics have been brought up to SOPA's attention um, at the meetings that we've been at attending you know, throughout Scotland. Health and social care, and that's an important thing. And usually when we've done surveys, that's been the the top hot topic because people are concerned about what will happen if they are in need and there's the integration to think about. Third, transport, travel and environment. I know coming from the borders, transport's a big thing and any rural area particularly, but even some people in the cities have difficulty. So um, another topic there. Community empowerment. Um, which is what this is all about, I suppose, um, empowering communities. Um, so perhaps that might be the thing that you find most interesting and most want to put forward. Um, retirement, pensions and money matters and funerals, that keep, comes really cheery. But the cost of seeing us off seems to be quite a concern to a lot of people and it does seem to be getting an expensive game to play. And the last, which I think is terribly important, communication, because so much is happening in so many, you hear of good things happening in different places in Scotland, and yet we're not always sharing as well as we might. So that's something also. So that that's your range of topics. So off you go. Any thoughts or comments on things that people think of? Which topics do you all think are the are the ones that really matter, that, that, that make the biggest difference or the biggest impact for folk? Housing. 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 To be able to live where you live mm -hmm. and have some connection with the live. community. I think health and social care is very, very important, considering that even earlier they had said that people are living longer. Mm -hmm. and that things are changing and there are so many ch things changing across the country that's going to have a great impact upon health and social care um, also bringing in as to how older people are treated within care home facilities mm -hmm. etc um, and I feel strongly that community representatives should maybe be sitting in more on care home or the care inspector to know what's actually happening in their area it's very very easy if you're a member of a very large body to say well this is what we do there but I think for communities they should have more say in these things because they know more about the community than and, mm -hmm. and to work together to work in partnership not in yes. isolation but to work very much in partnership you. yes yeah okay Hello. I have a very strange observation Mm -hmm. that if you are in a wheelchair, you may go on a bus. But if you're on a little metal scooter, mm -hmm. 
You're not allowed on the bus. Mm -hmm. And the strange thing is that when I went to England last year, I found that stagecoach allow people to, yes, drive their little scooters. And I have a friend who has such a wonderful vehicle and she can get around amazingly well. And she can even go on the new train because the combined mass of the scooter and her body is way under the 600 pound mark. So I really think we should be able to Mm -hmm. get some energy from Lothian, at least. Mm -hmm. Yep. What do other people think? So there are a couple of topics. A bid for housing and a bid for health and social care with mobility linking into it. Well, the same sort of um, theme is that the transport travelling environment. We come from Helensburgh <clears throat> and our area um, extends onto a peninsula. And if you're at the far end of that peninsula, you've got a long way to go to get into Helensborough. And we used to have a hospital relatively close to Helensborough, which has been closed to accident and emergency. Mm -hmm. If they come from around there, they've got to travel to Helensborough and then from there into Paisley. And it's mm -hmm. longer than the life expectancy of somebody that's seriously injured. <laughs> and they have to get a helicopter out if it's, if it's that bad. Yeah. That's the sort of thing we're we're facing there. Well, we not, can I ask, at another meeting, a gentleman from Helensburgh, I think it was a super meeting, was saying that you've made some clever deal with the rail people where you've got cheaper rail um I believe that, trips. so, yeah, for, well, for specific journeys. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's good. You need to press for more. Yeah. We but that, do that doesn't help somebody who's been no. in a car accident no. on the end of the peninsula. No. Because <laughs> there's no railway there. Uh, I had jotted some notes when I got the brief to attend here today, and but I had very much an open mind about what I was going to make as the major point, because I think all the key headings are major points, but obviously we can't address them all. Now, that's my long-winded way of saying that I like the lady there in the street. Sorry, what was your name again? Mary Benson. Mary Benson. I liked her idea of, the, if I've got it right, the community involvement mm -hmm. with the care homes. Mm -hmm because I've had experience, bad experience with my mother in a care home. And there's a conflict between the care home wants to provide a service at the lowest cost, and there's the Care Commission Scotland, who to my mind are the police for looking after these very vulnerable people in a care home. And I think it's a measure of society as how we look after are disaffected, are vulnerable, and are infirm. And it's just when you made that point, it was, it was okay up to a point. And I'm obviously I'm speaking from a vested interest, but there is a wider ram ramification that it was because we visited my mother regularly and we saw what was going on, mm -hmm. and weren't prepared to accept it. We went in on a circumspect basis and ask questions but basic questions that we were not healthcare professionals but we would say look this is common sense stuff why are you doing it mm -hmm. to give you an example i went in one afternoon and my mother was falling asleep in her wheelchair and there were half a dozen other senior ladies just like your auntie or your granny okay some of them were looking at the ceiling but they had on some sexual american victim TV program where they were all looking at the, the dysfunctionality of the family. I thought, they want to watch Coronation Street or Emma Day or something. No, I'm, I'm not, I'm not generalising there, but it was only because the staff had had their break before the ladies came into the TV lounge and nobody thought to switch the TV back. Now, that's a basic thing. And I would like to see that Marks and Spencers, I'm sorry to go on, they have like focus groups that if you're not happy with the, the food that they're doing and all the rest of it, you can go onto a focus group and sit in with Marks. Now, if we can do it with a department store like Marks and Spencers, we should be able to have a focus group go in, not in isolation, but trying to bring the standards up and interface. Sorry for the length. I'm, I'm going to turn that into a topic, um, because I think that bit about quality of care, um, is the one that runs through everything. So there's maybe something about the health and social care bit, including quality of care. So again, that's a kind of bid for that topic. 
to um, the people at home as well. Yeah, so the bit about quality around health. Right, so is, is this maybe bringing together a couple of the topics we care about? That it's about the quality of support people get, it's housing and the quality that... How do you get it and the quality around that and quality around health and social care and community links? Does that link in enough of a transport element for you? But one other thing I could say is if we talk about something that's very specific, like your point about the scooters, that's something we can flag up as well as an extra. But does that, I'm just kind of watching the reactions, does that feel as a topic or that brings together what a lot of people feel about? Right, so we're going to go with a kind of quality in housing and a quality in health and social care. So at least we've agreed our topics. And other things we're going to flag up, particularly that, that point about the scooters, is something very specific that we could go and check out. Can I also right. say I was surprised a while ago when I first we did an event with scooters, somebody that, you know, a company that made scooters, and we had the police there and various things, you know, different things relative to older people's interests. Um, older people who have never driven all their lives can buy one of these, and off they go. There's no test, there's nothing. And they can be really hell on wheels, can't they? Because they're off up the pavement. Right. And I do think there should be some okay. control. Okay, I'm now going to steer us back. <laughs> because I think between going over people's toes yes. and um, what happens to you is so entertaining. I think we need a whole hour just on that topic. So we'll put up a bid for that one for next time. But in the meantime, we're going to try and get you something about your, your scooter. Right. On the subject of broad health, social care and quality stuff, is there anything that anyone wants to add? Mary, was there something you had in your mind when yeah. you said it? Yes. As I say, when, when you listen to everything and you read all the, the reports and money's getting tighter all across the board, this is where I think partnership working is so, so important. And instead of people saying, well, there's my wee bit of the cake and there's my wee bit of the cake, people should be sitting around and saying, right, there's the cake, how can we equally divide it up? And taking very much um, on board what the gentleman over here was saying about in care homes, there is nothing worse than going in to see old people and they're all sitting around in circles because for that generation, if it hadn't been for them, we would have been under the proverbial jackboot. They should be treated with care, respect, Dignity, no matter across the board, I feel very, very strongly about that. We have representatives here today from our LGBT. Now, people should take on board everything that is, it's an, an individual person. It's not just a, oh, well, there's the 80 year olds, give them that, give the 90 year olds that, give the 60 year olds that. It's about looking at these people as individuals, treating them with the respect and dignity they deserve. And also including families in that. And on board what you were saying, sir, you walk in and, and some of these old buddies will have nobody. They will have nobody to represent them. They'll have no visitors. I had a case with my wee aunt who was a wee lady who, oh, she just liked to, so she had stepped out of band box. Colour coordinated. And you go in and see her with all colours of the rainbow and her hair all higgledy piggledy. And you have to say, where's the boss? That's fine. I was there for her. But what happens to me, Jeannie or Jimmy, that's got nobody? And I think it should be a standardised, this is what's expected. These are the standards. We do it with our police services. These are certain standards we have. We expect our representatives to have standards. So I think that's what we should be aiming for, because every one of us is going to, God willing, get older. And as one of my dear old friends said to me, they can give me the blue pill before I end up in one of those places. And we shouldn't be looking at that. We should be looking at thinking, if I have to end up in a care home, that's the care I'm going to get. But then also, it's the care that we give them within their own home. Instead of frightening them with, your care's getting changed for care watch to social integration from this to this. That's too much for old people to take on board. And I think it's, just, it's such a big thing, but I think people need to sit down and say... Yeah, along the same lines is that <clears throat> people with dementia going into hospital for a health reason were not being treated as people with dementia. They were being treated as people with a, a physical uh, problem. And 
Our local group in Helensburg, Dementia Resource Centre, are raising money to, in fact we've done it, to train nurses, to, to put a nurse trained in dementia care into each major hospital in Scotland. And that's helping to address that particular problem. My wife was a care assistant for about 30 odd years and she noted exactly what you said, Mary, about people being dressed in all sorts. And she was, you know, when her watch was on, they weren't. But she often went in and had to change people. And it's training. There's a large percentage of older people who are missed out, yes. completely missed out. And that's because they're not going into the situations of sheltered housing properly and asking the question, what about the levels of sheltered housing? I'm living in sheltered housing and my level is, what do they call it now, amenity, which is the lowest. There's nothing. And then what about the other section? Nobody talks about this. What are sheltered housing places giving to the, the, for the benefit of the people, and it's very little. And only the, and who says this is a severe case, you know, wh wh where there are people being attended to properly? I don't know if they exist. I often wonder if it's because they think one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I've it seen like some that. horrible cases mm -hmm. since I moved in. And I think I've got my wits about me. My, my legs, I could do with new ones. But uh, the head's okay. And I've seen these people. I've been there two years. And my eyes have been opened. Mm -hmm. And some tra tragic things happen, especially with people who have no relatives yes. or whose relatives don't bother with them because there's nobody else, believe me. The situation with health and social care at this present moment, things have been cut down to minimal. Staff are suffering. Staff, they don't have enough staff to look at the look after the amount of patients that patients or tenants or whatever that is in the unit. And especially talking about these older ladies sitting in round circles, it's depressing. It's depressing. And again, these people need to be talked talk to, have conversation. But most of the time, staff is doing things that they cannot sort of talk to everybody at the same time. I just take, for example, I used to work in the hospital for years. And coming up to my retirement in 2004, I realized hospital is not the place for me because of the fact that the staff shortage was too bad. You don't have time to talk to the patient. And it's, I worked in the stroke unit and with that one, you know, you know really you need to be, but most of the time it's paperwork most nurses are wanting to do and don't have time for caring for the patient let alone going into the, these old people's home. It's really depressing. It's just because of shortage of staff. Yeah. Uh -huh. People are cutting down yeah. in, in everything. Yeah. Yeah. One and then two. Yeah. Um, I was going to say I don't live in sheltered housing, luckily, at the moment, but I, I am in and out every day because I have two very elderly relatives that are actually there. And the thing I think that shocked me was raised was that actually there's no warden on site now. When my mother went in a few years ago, there was a warden on site, she lived on site, she worked at certain hours. Okay. They're now there for a few hours in the morning and it's a pool cord system, which isn't the same. It doesn't give them any kind of support if they actually need it really at the end. And their social support has gone because they were left to organise their own social facilities and they're all too elderly now and won't do it. I've actually volunteered and I've been told because I don't live in the sheltered house I can't actually volunteer to even put a DVD on on a Thursday afternoon for them. So we need, you know, somebody to take it up. There could be voluntary groups coming from schools, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, things like that. Some of the young folk could come in maybe and, and maybe do that. But also the thing about organising transport, the patient transport service is a boon. It's absolutely vital for getting them to hospital and my mother and aunt use it all the time, which is brilliant, particularly with our new super hospital that we have and the parking situation. But actually, we shouldn't see going to hospital as the only social outing that people will be taken to. We need to look at other things. <coughs> I 
go one up there and then Eric, yep. Could I mention that <clears throat> all my working life I look forward to retirement and uh, one of the bonuses were I was um, getting a bus pass. Now, getting a bus pass isn't as glorified as it seems because one, you have to know the bus regime of when the next bus is going to be. Uh, granted, it's free. But I feel that we're um, penalised because you can only go as far as Carlisle on your Scottish bus pass. You can't use it anywhere in England. Um, also, the train service that's provided, I find it hard to accept <coughs> that you can get a train from London to Edinburgh for a fiver, but it costs you nearly £100 to go from Edinburgh to London. And I phoned up the railway company and complained about that, that we were actually being... Uh, uh, I can't remember. Discriminated against, uh, thanks. Uh, discriminated against because we're Scottish, and yet Parliament is saying, uh, uh, this is a Parliament are saying that we're all one country and the rest. But we are. There is a demarcation. So I'd like to that to be addressed. That we have a bus pass that you could go anywhere in the country. You can travel anywhere for the same rail fare. And again, it wasn't that long ago that we had go anywhere in Scotland for a pound or somewhere on a train. But even if they were raising that to five pounds, I'm sure there's a lot of senior citizens out there who would love to travel by train because it's safer, it's quicker, it's whatever. And again, if you're in, uh, if you didn't travel very well, if you can travel better in a train than you can in a bus, then I'm sure a lot of people, more people, would uh, use it. Okay. So both not quite on our, our topic, but is that one of the things we're going to add on our? We've got our parallel transport list. So we're going to include rural areas, that, and the, the bit about the subsidies. Right, we're doing well on it. Over there. And then we've got to get to... <laughs> we've not forgotten you. One and then two. No, no, no. <laughs> um, I mean, when we're talking about um, care in, in um, nursing homes, etc., I mean, I don't think any of us are going to disagree with anyone else that it should be the top quality care. I don't think that you would find that there's any member of the Scottish government or any government that would actually disagree with it. And so what we've got to maybe be thinking about was how do we get there to that point where um, older people are being cared for in the best possible way. I mean, I think something was mentioned earlier about carers should be given at least the living wage. Yes. I mean, it shouldn't be a job that you do because you can't get any other job that it, it's about, um, you know, a professional, um, career-orientated uh, care work, and, and that should be available, and that, again, should drive up standards. It is problematic, because I don't think any care home would write in its mission statement that, well, actually, we're not going to bother caring. You see, it would be quite, quite the opposite. So, you know, the, we've, we've got... To, maybe try and think what our strategy would be to try and achieve what we're all agreed upon here. But one of the things that um, I would like to raise, I don't know if any of you have experienced it, it's a new thing that's been rolled out in Lanarkshire. I think maybe it's operated in Fife and it's called the Hospital at Home yes. um, mm -hmm. thing, <laughs> project, yes. whatever. And rather than um, admit automatically there is a, a provision for GPs um, to request this team uh, of, of medics and nursing staff to actually treat the individual in their home, which they say is what most people want. Mm -hmm. They want to stay in their home, which is probably right. You know. Mm -hmm. Now, we've, we've had in uh, South Lanarkshire, anyway, a couple of presentations. I think I've been to three um, where this has been put forward, you know, is, is something that's uh, been introduced and is put forward in a very positive way, as you can imagine, and uh, the examples that are quoted are always very positive. It's the best thing since sliced bread. But the one thing that was missing in all of it was the effect on carers, either uh, paid carers or, you know, members of the family, whatever, that are going to be left, if you like, with having to 
to administer drugs or do whatever is necessary in order uh, to get this person better again. Now, the idea that we can have a presentation these days that doesn't mention uh, carers and the effect on them, I find staggering. I mean, after all the, the things we've been talking about for a number of years. So, I mean, that's something I would flag up. For, for everyone has been of concern. I don't think anybody's going to argue against hospital at home in principle being a good thing, but we only accept it's a good thing if all the bases are covered, and they certainly haven't been so far. Oh, and sorry, I'm Anne Burney from <laughs> South Lanarkshire Seniors Together. Can, um, can I just ask a question um, before we move on? Um, Mary mentioned standards for care homes, and there are also standards for care at home. Um, and I'm going to come back in a minute to the hospital bit, the hospital at home. But for do, are people around this room, put up your hand if you think you are pretty confident about what is in the standards for care homes and care at home. Right, and I think that, in a sense, says what the gap is. And I'm conscious I'm not putting my hand up even though I should know. Um, I just Joan. wanted to say that I know that the care inspectorate comes to the sheltered housing yes. place that, and they come, they're supposed to come unexpectedly and catch mm -hmm. them at bad things. Or good but, things. But, or good things. <laughs> but they do come and there are standards being yes. met because I've noticed an upgrade in the, the, the house that I'm in, right. that okay. I live in. Uh, they, are, they are looked at yeah. carefully. Yeah, they only are. One <coughs> and then two. Right. Uh, Mary, can I say, please don't call me sir or gentleman. My name's John. I'm just an ordinary person like everybody else. A couple of things briefly. I think the phrase you were using, if I'm wrong, I might be wrong, is the holistic approach. It's got to be everybody according to, to their needs. But the, the lady here, you brought on the, 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 the aspect of people who didn't have a family having someone engage with them so they're not sitting looking at the wallpaper. Now, I mentioned my mother. She's unfortunately died. But I had a friend whose mother ended up in a care home. Now, some care homes, um, you must acknowledge the good as well as the bad, some care homes have programmes of entertainment. They'll have a bingo afternoon. They'll have a memories afternoon. But my friend was faced with going in and she was the entertainment. She would get DVDs that she thought her mum would like and the other ladies would like, and she would jolly them along. Now, I'm conscious we have to come up with a possible campaign action as a strategy. Now, I don't have this fully developed because I'm just thinking while I'm sitting here, but we want our own relatives to be looked after and engaged within the care home. We want those people who don't have relatives. There's no reason why it can't be intergenerational. The old people don't need old people. There's no reason why young people shouldn't go in. And 2012 was the European year of intergenerationality, so it's only three years away. But so everything else, the concept shouldn't disappear after the end of that year. Now, I said I didn't have a strategy developed, but... If I can try and explain it this way, the Macmillan, Macmillan nurses go in and help with palliative care and end-of-life care. Mm -hmm. Now, they're obviously set up as a national organisation. Could we not explore setting up a national organisation of people who would have to be vetted, obviously, in all these practical housekeeping aspects, but people who could sign up to put something back into the community because volunteering does give you a boost individually. The World Health Organization research has proven that far less research that's taken place in the UK. But why don't we set up an organization like the Macmillan one to go in and, and engage with people, support them, uh, look after them, uh, befriend them uh, to a certain extent and go in on a national basis. Mm -hmm. Now, as I say, I haven't thought this all through. It just came to me while I was listening to the various contributions made. But what does anyone else think? Well, I, actually, I think you find a lot of it is already happening. And it's maybe making sure it happens everywhere. Um, so it's national coverage rather than it. One of the reasons I'm saying that is I'm looking at Grey Matters, who do a lot of really good stuff like that already. Yes. 
I'm thinking more of my own personal experience. My right. sister-in-law was in a care home for 18 months. She eventually died of cancer. Oh. But <clears throat> she, before she went in, she was looking after herself. And the doctor, the mind doctor, would not uh, um, accept that she had dementia in the early stages. My wife was an ex-care, well, it was a care yeah. assistant. She recognised it. And in the end, he said, I can't do anything with your sister until something goes wrong. She was in, we eventually got her into a care home, a long story, but the care home was excellent. It was built purely for dementia sufferers. So you didn't have a mix of elderly, frail and dementia people, mm -hmm. which causes a problem in itself. And in that care home, there were only 10 people per unit. There were several units in it, and they were a village, and they had their own sort of infrastructure. Her previous job in life was a, care, uh, was a superintendent of a children's home. She thought the other residents in her section were her children, and she was in charge to the extent that the staff used to call her the matron. And things went along very well until the last couple of months of her life when she thought the children weren't behaving themselves and she got involved in fisticuffs a couple of times. <laughs> but up until that point, everything went smoothly. But we as carers, my wife and I, were going in to visit her two or three times a week from the East Coast to the West Coast. And our presence there was a bit like you're saying, John. You, we had, as volunteers, we were helping out when we were there. We were interacting with the other residents in that section and doing the same sort of thing that you'd like to see a, a body of people doing. Can I ask... Um, John, um, could we kind of phrase what you were saying in a slightly different way? Rather than having a national organisation when there already is a lot happening locally, is it about making sure that something is happening in every place and in every part of the country? I was just going to come that, back on, on, your, on, on, your, on your last... To, yes, you're, you're quite it. right, because I picked up in the phrase that something is happening somewhere, but it's not happening everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. And I think that's too important just yes. to have it piecemeal. It must be... <coughs> would you agree, Mary? It must be yes. across... Yeah across the board yeah. well that that too and can I say that now that uh, mum has passed on I don't know where exactly she is but I will I will be going back to engage with care homes subject obviously to the rules and regulations and also going back to my own organization to say can we engage we have some intergenerational uh, projects with young people but a, a, a statistic I learned fairly recently is that there are more people in the UK aged over 50 than there are under 18. Now, no harm to youth. I was young myself at one point. But the current balance of importance seems to be skewed. And bearing in mind the numbers aspect, I think that should be redressed some way. And I would like to think that my people would maybe go into care homes, subject to some sort of regulatory framework and vetting. Yeah. But I take your point, the question you asked, yes, I agree. Okay. Let's rephrase it. Let's rephrase it. Okay. Right. Yep. I just have one small thing to say about carers. The companies that they work for mm -hmm. treat them like robots. And the worst of it is that they come in and they see the, the person and then they don't come again. There's some other person comes to see that person. And when you get old and your brain is not working properly, to have that kind of instability is yeah. very, very bad. I think it's worse than not having a carer. Mm -hmm. they continue. Yeah. But there isn't any. Yep. Okay, John. I live in an area which is very well uh, placed for looking after people. The built an equality project, I'm on the management committee of that, have been for 20 years, and I'm on various community, local things that have been going on for that length of time. And they're all stri stripped for money. Obviously, everything is nowadays, but they're still going on, and work is done. But often, a wee help wouldn't come amiss when 
local organisations are operating and trying to keep up a standard of, of quality that they've maintained over years. But nowadays, they're not getting the help. There's no money, yeah. extra money, to One keep day. them going. Right. Um, and then, I keep forgetting Eric, but I'm, I'm next, thank, and then Eric, thank you. get you in. I think that was such an important point made about continuity of care. I mean, I think practically yeah. every meeting I've ever been to when we're talking about um, paid carers is, is the problem because there isn't continuity of care. And I mean, yes, things happen. I mean, people are sick and people go on holiday and whatever. Yeah. But at the very least, um, there should be a briefing. And I know for a fact in, in my area, in East Kilbride, that uh, there isn't always a briefing given to the carer who's about to go into somebody's home, very often someone with dementia. I mean, this isn't good enough, and that's a relatively straightforward thing to do. But um, also, taking up John's point, you know, about the need for... Uh, a buddy or a guardian or, or someone, um, you know, when somebody's in care and they don't have relatives, um, and it does seem to happen in some areas, not others, well, what we're talking about then is sharing of best practice yes. and maybe um, using SOPA as a means of being able to share best practice so all of us uh, could present to SOPA things that maybe are happening in their areas that are good, um, and this can be uh, fed out um, to the rest of Scotland because they have so many uh, organisations around the country. Thank you. Right, Eric, did you...? Yes, I mean, I said already from Big Lottery Fund, the first thing I'm going to say is not related at all to Big Lottery Fund. I'm going to disclaim that so I don't get any trouble. But it, and a lot of the points have already been made. It was about, um, in terms of carers and how they're paid and their qualifications are standard... I mean, I was appalled um, that somehow they think, it was announced just last week, I think, that a lot of the uh, care organisations are going to start paying the minimum the living wage. So what? You know, it, <laughs> these are important jobs these people are doing. You know, they, and they're saying, oh, this may cause us to raise prices or whatever. It doesn't cause them raising prices when they're taking their shareholders are taking their hit. It's just, it's just appalling. These are important jobs for people to do, and they should be paid and trained accordingly. So that's me. I'll get down off my soapbox now. The second point I just wanted to make was in um, funding. Obviously, big lottery funds are funder. In fact, SOAP has actually been, I think so. Anyway, we've got a logo on here today, paid for by Awards for All. I mean, that's a very popular um, fund. It gives you grants of up to £10,000. It's supposed to be very easy to access. I couldn't comment on that because I don't ever apply to it. But we do, I mean, that's, it's our bread and butter as an organisation, basically. The number of small awards, true awards for all, £10,000, making huge differences to all these sort of groups, all the sort of work you're talking about today. So if you don't know about it, get on the website, find out, and get your applications in. Can I just say quickly, on the subject of money, uh, the lady there said it's a question of cost. Now, it always is, but I've sat in various meetings here and elsewhere where everybody says, give us more money and we can solve the problem. But more money doesn't always solve the problem. Um, two things I would say briefly about that. There was a report this morning that I think it was NHS Fife spent £3 million for minimal increases in targets and object, objectives that they had. So they threw all that money at it and got a tiny, tiny improvement. So giving it more money doesn't always work. Um, what I'm proposing is that with a small amount of seed money, if going back to your point and keep me right on it, and that if we brought the, the, the work that's been done in various areas, brought it together and rolled it out to other areas on a volunteer basis. A small amount of money would, to my mind, produce big dividends. But more money isn't always the answer. Yep. Betty, did you want to... Yep. There's just a couple of observations. One was, listening to you, the lady across there, I suddenly thought, instead of um, us being berated and having the name person, which has been distinctly unpopular for children, mm -hmm. possibly a name person yeah. for the elderly is what we need. So maybe somebody could take that one up. And the other one is, I suppose, for the police, who I'm feeling a bit sorry for since my daughter is a policewoman, um, or police person, being correct, um, and being berated about the Janet Mackay getting lost and not being found. Now, we're not, you know, we need to come out of this pie-in-the-sky stuff. I work for the NHS 
place for many years and the money is not there and it's not going to be there for taking in every demented person, including ourselves, when we get there and putting us in beautiful care homes. More people will live at home with dementia than anything else. But in actual fact, to give people with dementia a bit of dignity, to give carers a bit of peace of mind, actually we tag criminals with GPS. We need to start being, I think, imaginative about what we do. That lady would have been found and would not have been wandering about. Yeah. The rugby player whose father came over from, was it Australia? I'm quite sure has got a wee touch of the old dementia and was wandering about and lying under a bush. You know, and this is how people die. And it's going to become increasingly one in three, they say, of the generation now are going to be affected. We need to look to let people have a bit of independence. But if they have GPS attached, and there'll be all the human rights and all the rest of it, but I think I'd rather have a bracelet attached to me and be, wonder, be able to wander about in and out my garden and stuff than getting lost. Now, Big Lottery might fund some of that, although I think it'll take a bit of will. And I think that's a big issue for the future. Ironically, that's the discussion I was having with uh, Diana before about because I hadn't heard of this, and it makes uh, eminent sense to me. Um, and of course, the way around any human rights would be that you just get permission to use that from the individual or th from their carers. Uh, all I wanted to really say, and it comes strong from every conversation that's coming here, I absolutely agree. This isn't about money. Um, it's very easy to sit here and say how hard pressed we all are because there isn't money, but. The true solution to all of this is very strong partnership working, yes. locality-based partnership working that has organisations like SOPA um, disseminating good practice. Because we're, you know, that's the perfect example that we're still not quite got it right yet. Um, but if we are doing that, then we will collectively have quite a good pot of money across services. I've got personal experience within the police, and that's the one bit that we haven't really touched on in this conversation. Um, a, accountability <coughs> for all organisations, and we have held Care Inspectorate to account for some uh, tragic circumstances that we had reported to us. And remember, some of these things you're talking about will be criminal. Um, so let's make sure that that happens. That will only happen if you've got these strong local relationships where you can lift up a phone to the local inspector, local cop, whatever, to ask these questions. Um, but collectively, we actually have a very strong means of dealing with these issues. Right. Well, I'm going to take a few more comments, and then we're going to pull it together so we know what we're feeding back. So, um, Joan, um, this side, and then we'll check particularly anyone who's maybe not contributed yet. I just wanted to see it's the start of dementia, to recognise when you have to intervene with yeah. the person because they have up and down days and, and I've realised living in sheltered housing there might be two or three people at one time suffering from dementia. The beginning is very difficult to, to decide when to intervene and I could imagine if they were to wear something they might be very reluctant to do that at the beginning. You know, it's when you can intervene with their permission yeah. that would it's be quite difficult to, yeah. to place. Yeah. But if you're living in a, a communal type of uh, place, the other people there recognise quickly. Yeah. And if they could find a way to help, to, to acknowledge that the person is... Because I've seen it myself, you know, people going about... And sometimes it's yeah. very quick. Sometimes yeah. it's, you know, you're, you're amazed that the person can be okay yeah. one fortnight and, and showing signs yeah. when you're talking to them of something. So it, it is difficult. Yeah. Can I also just ask, and again, a facilitator thing, I'm thinking of a conversation that um, Michael and Bill and I were having about, it's also about attitudes in society and us being willing if we see somebody who's a wee bit distressed and wandering in any sense to say are you okay but we've sometimes got to the stage where we feel we're afraid to do that in case somebody thinks we're doing something yeah. wrong yeah. and that bit about a caring compassionate society yeah yeah um right this is the last one and then we're going to start Joyce have you anything I was going to say about tagging a few years ago we were appalled that Addie walked around with a name tag on you and that's now accepted did. We do, and it's, it's just a case of getting used to doing something and becoming an accepted way of doing it for tagging people for all sorts yeah. of reasons. And having designer tags, yes, that mm -hmm. are beautiful. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> they're proud to wear one. 
Yes. A Gucci one. Yes. Harvey Nicks. I mean, come on, we want to up it a bit. Um, right. No, I'm absolutely serious. Right. Once David Beckham starts wearing it, it'll all be fine. Right. Um, moving on. Okay, we have got nine minutes. Can I just check with you what it is we want to feed back? The two points that I had noted that people were um, kind of both saying, and there was lots of agreeing, so the body language was agreeing. One was this point about somehow having everywhere that is delivering care a bit where there are people from outside coming in and having that being around, but also being able to take the initiative, see that people are connected with their communities. So something that makes that just a wee bit more regular and formal than it, it is now. So basically what I'm thinking of is, is that, as John's point. It's an, on a national basis, it has we to want be it to, We want it to be, it, it has to happen nationally, mm -hmm. even though the how it happens will... Maybe local. Will, will be local. So we, we want the best of both worlds between the national coverage and the local. So I was seeing nods at that one. So that might be one we could raise. The other one is the bit about um, continuity in paid care and the, the respect to the workers and that bit about pay and conditions and training being respected as much as um, a, acting in a respectful way, but also that bit about a continuity of service that is there's something that links maybe the two of those and whether those are two motions or two linked ones. And then we've got what I call my transport list uh, with scooters being at the head of it. Could I just say that I've worked in um, daycare uh, and in the community with older people? Yeah. And the training, you're saying training, training is <coughs> important, but most of the training is lip service. Yes, yes. It is so lip service, it's real? just damage limitation. Yeah. Yes. We've trained you how to do that. Yes. Yeah. And I just think the training is very... Yes. I've actually facilitated, tra facilitated training for people um, that are coming into, the uh, coming into service to work, to work with people with dementia. And while the training is good and it does raise, a, raise their awareness, how they assess it at the end is completely wrong. It's, the, the, it's just... No, they send in a written, a written essay about what they've learnt. It goes to Stirling, they say it's OK. I don't know who wrote that. Yeah. It's lip service. That's, what, that's all it's doing. Ticking Ticking the a box. Box. Yeah. Ticking the box. Mm -hmm. Right, OK. Come on up there. Yeah, there's a nursing home and a care home. Or has nursing homes been done away with? <clears throat> there are slight differences in how different places are registered. Some are registered to also do more nursing. I understand in a nursing home you had to have a nursing qualification yeah, yeah. in order to nurse people. And people who went there no, that's had a medical there. condition, whereas people who went into a care home didn't have any medical right. conditions okay. and they were treated by anybody who was on the staff as right. paid staff. It's infinitely more complicated than that, as I understand it. And that's my bit about saying do we, we, the thing is the standards are really clear, but we don't know what they are. So there's maybe a bit about them being communicated in a way that all of us kind of can understand and know what good care is. Can I just say very quickly, Anne, that if that was the case and it was a nationally standard, that's the standards of care. That's mm -hmm. what's expected. So it doesn't matter whether you end up in a care home or a nursing yep. home in Les Mahego or you end up yes. in Stony Burn in West Lothian. Mm -hmm. These are the standards of care. This is what is expected. And yes, I take on board what Betty was saying earlier that you know you have to pay people a decent rate. But there was nursing qualifications many years ago were TLC, tender loving care. Yes, people are pushed for time, but when you're getting an old buddy or a, a younger person, let's not forget, mm -hmm. you know, um, up. What's to say, good morning, a wee bit nippy out there this morning, Mrs Jones or whatever. You don't call them first name until they give you permission. How do you feel this morning, Jeannie or whatever, if you've been given permission to do that? It's a wee bit nippy out there. Oh, I was, you'll never guess what I was. Because right. they want to know, they want to be included. Yeah. And that... I hate to say it, but it doesn't matter if you're in the caring profession. If you care, you care, and if you don't care, it'll no matter how much money we get. OK, mm -hmm. right. Diana, and Can then we'll try and pull it together. I, I mean, there are already um, levels of... Yes. And so how are you going to ensure 
they're pushed forward. Do you see what I mean? Yes. They're already in place. You've got the care commission or whatever mm -hmm. they're called going out and inspecting and maybe not having enough teeth mm -hmm. because a lot of care homes are privately owned mm -hmm. and they're there for money. I mean, they're there yes. to make a business mm -hmm. and maybe that's the priority is against really caring. And they're, I just wonder how you're expecting someone to enforce those standards. I think it's more, um, Diana, I, or Diana, I would think it would be to say, right, in each community, we should have people from these communities involved. We should they have lay inspectors, though, yes, don't but they? No, but I'm talking about people in, the actual, in that actual community where these care homes, nursing homes, um, mental health units, whatever, that it's actual people from these communities that can go in, pop in at any time, just to say hello. I mean, it's the old respect thing. You don't go in when people are having their dinner. I mean, no. You know. Being sensible. Because yes. I think we're past the point of detail. Yes. We're now into big strategy. Right. Right. Uh, because you have to feed it back. Um, what we want is a motion, a, a, an action point. Action. That's taking this point about standards in both care homes and care at home and sheltered housing. So it's across that spectrum that is complementing and reinforcing the standards that are there and the way they're implemented. We want to see some better implementation, including when it's criminal actions really upping the, the implementation. But we also want something that is voluntary, community-based from those communities that is having a bigger presence and it has some kind of link the details of which we haven't quite worked out yet, but we will. So we want to have that greater community input to see that those standards are actually imposed. Is that the sort of thing that we want to, to say? Quality impact assessment. Well, I think we'll because try and call it something that's not already called, because then folks say we're doing it. I think but, we're but saying it, we want to up it. But the trouble is with quality impact assessment, even People are not doing it. Exactly. Oh, that's, so yeah. to, that's right. Yeah. So, People so, are not doing that. Yeah. So what we want because is... Because this is something that is, should be ongoing. Yeah. yeah. You understand? So yes. I think what we're saying is we want all the quality impact assessment and we want the care inspector, all that to happen. We want it to happen for real. don't quite know how we word that. But we want this community input alongside it, partly to reinforce it, but also to be a helpful, positive way of supporting people and giving people a better quality of life. So which is cost effective. Which is cost effective. And the details of which we will work out yes, fairly soon. Will. Right. Is that one of our, our action points yes. that we want? Right. Do we want to raise a second action point, which is about um, the way in which people who work in this field are paid and treated and trained, but with that comes... The, the bit about acting in a caring way. So we're recognising the two go together and we're wanting to up the, the way in which those, that role is respected within the society. Is that kind of getting close to it? And somehow link it to continuity of care. Right. Okay. Just wanting to do a job. Yes. I mean, that's the big difference. Vocation. Yeah means that they care, it means all the things that they need to be. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Right, okay. So somehow we're going to take those two points and we're going to get them into kind of a recommendation? Yes. And you will be happy with that? Yes. And when Diana stands up and says this, you'll be cheering her on. And when... Thanks to the leadership of the big lottery, and I say leadership rather than money, because I think sometimes yes. um, being independent and helping ask the questions and the leadership from Police Scotland, we start raising these things. You and your various groups will help move it on. Right? OK, on that basis, we are now seven seconds past, but we've done it. So can I say a huge thank you to everybody for all their hard work, and uh, we will now put it together and do the best we can. Um, the beautiful Sarah has been scribbling like mad <clears throat> and everything that we've um, said, if we're not sure about it, we can check. And thanks to also the lovely technical side, we can also check it out in all sorts of ways. So thank you very much to them as well. <laughs> right.